the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I mentioned, we're going to be looking this Lent at stories about Jesus at the table. And next week, you'll really want to tune in because we'll have a special guest singer. Not that we don't love Elaine and what a perfect song for the scripture we just read that she chose for this morning. But this passage always makes me think of a rule that pastors should know by now. Be careful if you ask what you think is a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question being one that you don't expect an answer to. I remember once asking a congregation, who are we trying to please, ourselves or God? And a three-year-old answered, God, like, Pastor Terry, you should know that one. But whenever I talk about one of these parables, the parable of the wedding banquet or the great feast that we read today, I think of a guy named Ken. Because the last time I preached this story, I said to them, well, you know, this would be like being invited to the palace to have dinner with the king. I said, I'm guessing none of you have been invited to a palace to have dinner with the king. Raise your hand if you have been invited to a palace to have dinner with the king. And lo and behold, Ken raised his hand, and we all looked at him and said, what are you talking about? He said, I was invited by the king of Sweden, and I went to the palace and had dinner. We were like, what do you mean the king of Sweden? His company had a contract with the nation of Sweden, and he was invited to a state dinner. So the sermon just sort of changed its focus, and we all looked at Ken, and we said, tell us about that. And he explained what it was like to have dinner at the palace. You don't sit down until the king sits down. You don't pick up your fork until the king picks up his fork. You don't eat until the king is eaten, and if the king takes one bite and doesn't like it, doesn't matter. If you love it, you don't ache another bite. You put your fork down and you watch. He had to go through a protocol training in order to have dinner with the king of Sweden. Hmm. Not quite Emily Post. Some of you remember Emily Post, or some of you remember doing etiquette lessons in school, which I think they gave up years and years and years ago. But in the first century in particular, there were very distinct rules about how you behaved when you went to dinner. So that's one of the reasons Jesus challenges people when he goes to dinner. And this was certainly a case of quid pro quo here. One hand washes the other. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Because while provisions would be made for the poor, these were Pharisees after all. They were the ones who observed the letter of the law exactly. They would never think of inviting the poor into their homes. So why did they invite Jesus, who was poor? He was the son of a carpenter, and he was an itinerant preacher, a traveling guy. We're not quite sure why he would be invited, but we have several stories, very poignant stories about Jesus being invited to the home of a Pharisee, or eating with Pharisees, or eating in the presence of Pharisees. Perhaps it was because he was a curiosity, because so many people had heard about him healing and feeding and teaching and making things sound very different than they'd ever heard before, that maybe people just wanted to see him and they thought, well, if we invite Jesus, everyone will want to come and be here to see him. But we know that they also watched him because they were trying to trap him and get him to say things that were against God's law so that they might be able to condemn him, which is eventually what they were able to do. And Jesus does not disappoint. If you watch Jesus, something's going to happen. There's a man at the dinner who has dropsy. Dropsy is an old way of saying edema, which is swelling. This was a man who was in great distress because his body had retained so much fluid it was swelling. He was probably in great agony as he sat there. And sometimes people with edema will have their skin break down and they will just be miserable. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath by asking them this question? If any of you would see your child fall into a well, would you wait until the Sabbath was over to pull him out? Hold on, hon. We'll be there tomorrow. No, you would do that. They couldn't answer him then. And then it gets worse because then he sort of looks at the host and starts to give him a little bit of trouble about what he's been doing. He says to the crowd... Don't clamor for the greatest seats in the house, the best seats in the house, or you may be embarrassed when you are asked to move to the cheap seats. And then he says to his host, and when you invite people, don't invite the rich, don't invite the quid pro quoers, don't invite those who can invite you to their parties and their dinners and repay you. Instead, invite the poor so they cannot repay you, and then God will see what you've done and consider you to be righteous. Don't take the best seat in the house. Now, if you ever went to junior high or now they call it middle school and you sat at the wrong table at lunch, you'll know what that feeling is like. 
if you're not one of the popular cool kids and you sit at the cool kid popular table, everyone will either get up and move or they will tell you in no uncertain terms to get lost. It would be like an adult going to the airport and strolling up to the first class tickets with your coach ticket in hand and sitting in the seat up front or going to Camden Yards and not waiting until the eighth inning to go down to the empty good seats, but sitting in someone's seat and have the usher come and tap you on the shoulder and say, I'm sorry, get out. This is not your seat. And then you'd be embarrassed. But Jesus says, invite the poor, invite those who cannot repay you. Don't clamor after the good seats. A friend of mine has a dinner church in his congregation. It's called the table and one Friday a month they would have people in before COVID happened and people would come and share a meal together. Well after COVID happened they can't do that but they decided some of the people were coming just because they were poor and they couldn't afford a meal and so they give meals out to go and cars line up in the parking lot and several churches come together to feed them. This week in particular they had it even though that was icy and cold because they decided that people who really needed the food would come out for it. And the chair of his staff parish relations committee decided to go out and greet people this time and decided to talk to them, not just to tell them to go around back and get in the line of cars, but to say to them, we're so glad to see you this evening. Why are you here? And people said they were embarrassed, but they needed the food. Some people said they couldn't afford to pay their heating bills at home and it was just nice to get out for a while. And others said, we're just so very lonely and isolated in the house. And yet there were people in the congregation when they had their council meeting who said, we got to get rid of this thing, all these people coming here just looking for a handout. Not many people said that, but a few said that. And it broke the pastor's heart. We are called to invite everyone to the table. But when Jesus called them to that same accountability and reminded them of what God was asking of them, they were a little uncomfortable, and one of them actually tried to change the subject. He said, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven, expecting a rousing, amen, amen, you got that right. But then Jesus gets worse and tells them a parable, where they don't look very good either, and talks about someone who invites them. Let's pretend it's the king of Sweden here. Invites people to come to his home for dinner. And what do they do? They make excuses. I just got married. I can't go. I just bought a new set of oxen. I got to try them out. That's like saying, I just got my first sports car and I want to put the top down and I want to drive. Even though it's 12 degrees outside, I got to put the top down because I got a convertible. And then what does the host do? But he sends the slaves into the streets and said, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Quite a story, quite a collection of stories, parables within a story about Jesus having dinner at someone's home. He's invited. We don't know if he's invited because they want to try to trap him, but he isn't exactly the most well-behaved guest, is he? Because he points out to them where they could be doing something different. But you know, if we're honest, we're everybody in this story other than Jesus because we watch him too. We watch when we pray, we bargain with him and say, who will you heal, Lord? Will you heal my son, Will you heal my husband, my daughter, my mother, my aunt? How many times have I been with someone who told me, I prayed, God, if you will heal this person, I will be faithful. But if you don't, I'm done with you. We do tend to watch what Jesus does. We clamor after the positions of power, don't we, sometimes in churches? I've had people tell me, I give so much money to this church, I'm entitled to whatever position I want to hold. I have had people say that to me. Not here at Epworth, but people have said that to me in the past. And I've also, unfortunately, been witness to someone saying to a visitor, you need to move, you're in my seat, this is my pew. Or people who fought over the last seat in the house, the back corner as far away from the pulpit as they could get. And one of them said, if he's sitting there next week, I'm never coming back again. We clamor after things that we think we are entitled to. We feel like we should be the ones that God favors because we're faithful. We come to church, we sing in the choir, we tithe, we do all kinds of great, wonderful things. So why would God care about these other people as much as us? And we do minister to the poor, but how often do we really invite the people that we help to worship with us? We need to be doing that more. 
because we tend to make excuses ourselves, don't we? I would come to church, Lord, but I'm too busy. I would do this. I would take this office, but I just can't handle it right now. I've got so much going on. And if we're honest, we're like those people out in the streets who never get invited anywhere because they don't feel worthy enough. The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. In the first century, all of them were considered to be sinners because they were responsible for their own misery and their own suffering. And if we're honest, we too sometimes look down on people and blame them for their own misfortune. Or even sometimes if it is their fault, if people have been addicted and they've used their money to buy drugs or alcohol instead of feeding their children, we think they deserve where they are. But this is not who Jesus is calling us to be. And sometimes we stay away because we do feel unworthy, we feel unloved, we feel judged by others, we feel like this is for other people. I'm not good enough to be here, Lord. And I have seen people come forward to receive communion looking like I'm going to whack off their head with an axe because they're so sinful and unworthy. Or worse yet, the people who don't even come to the table because they don't feel like God could possibly love them knowing what they've done. We are all over this story. But there's hope in this story because what does the servant say when the master sends him out into the street to bring in everyone else? He says, there is still room. That's why we sang what we did this morning from the Songs of Zion, the old spiritual, plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room in the Father's kingdom, plenty good room, plenty good room, just choose your seat and sit down. There's room enough for all of us, the sinners, the saints, the in-betweens. There's room for us if we have fallen short of the glory of God, there's still room for us. Even if we've sinned by judging others and looking down on them, there's still room for us because if God in Jesus Christ, there is grace, there is peace, there is redemption, there is hope. And we're called to come in and take a seat. Just be careful where you sit. Sit with the people around you. Look at them as your brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what they are, what they've done, who they have hurt. Even if they've hurt you in the past, we are called to a life of redeeming love and of grace and of peace and of hope and of mercy. Jesus calls us to his table. Just as he called those who would betray and deny and desert him, he still calls us to his table because everything that he has, he is willing to share. There is still room. There is room for you, there is room for me, there is room for all of God's creation. So, just like the kids in the party that we talked about, give an invitation to everyone you meet, because in the name of Jesus Christ, there's no one who can be excluded, because all are welcome. That's why we sang Gather Us In this morning. I know it's not a favorite, it's not even one of my favorites, but isn't it so great to hear Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. God is calling you by name. You are invited and you are loved. Come in, choose your seat, and sit down. Amen. During this season of